What does warfare look like in 2030? You've got AI far more advanced, um, uh, humanoid robotics, and I know your position on humanoid robotics, but the ability to enhance super soldiers takes yep. on a brand new meaning. Yep. You know, drones have gone from zero to infinity in, in record speed. It's extraordinary. Uh, what, you know, uh, what are you thinking? Well, I hate to be a cynic here, Peter, but I actually think warfare in 2030 is going to look more or less the same as it does today, okay. with a few very small exceptions where things are breakthrough capabilities getting in. I said earlier, you go to war with the tools you have, not the sure. tools you want. The reality is the vast bulk of our arsenal was built a decade or two or three ago. And so even as companies like Andrel move very, very quickly, like we're trying to build things that are relevant to a fight with a great power, whether it's Iran or Russia or particularly China. Uh, but, but even if we move at breakneck speed as fast as we can, we're going to end up being 1% of the fight, 2% mm -hmm. of the fight, right? I mean, like we, we can try our very best. It's, it's going to take years and years to replace these legacy capabilities with, with new yeah. things. So I think what will the battlefield look like? You're going to have a weird anach an anachronistic mash of things that were built in the Reagan era, like our tracked vehicles built in the Reagan era operated by humanoid robotics that just rolled off the line a few weeks ago, but only like only like one column of, the, of them and all the rest are going to be crewed by people. You're going to have things like AI fighter jets flying alongside aircraft that were built under Bill Clinton and they're going to be flying together in formation. And unfortunately, there's probably going to be a lot more manned aircraft and the AI aircraft are going to be a tip of the spear, val you know, a valuable component. They'll, they'll be the tip of the spear making first contact and they're probably all going to be blown up and we're going to say, shit, I wish we would have been building those for another couple of years. It's just 2030. I mean, it's close. It we're, is. It, it's, there's, it's, just, it's just so little time to build it, deploy it, and then train people on it. Remember, you can't just deliver these things day one. People have to train for years to become proficient in something. Imagine if you showed up with a new alien weapon system pulled straight out of the Roswell wreck today, and you handed it to a soldier and said, you have to go to war with this tomorrow. That won't work. You, you, you need to develop <clears throat> tactics. You need to develop doctrine. Right. You need to have him train with his squad for years, let's, potentially. Let's take it slightly different. Let's talk about the 0.01%. Let's, talk let's about, do it. Let's talk about the, the elite Navy SEAL team uh, or equivalent out there that will have the oh, well, most advanced yeah. technology and... Well, you're going to see... You're gonna what see, do they look like? You're going to see lower fatality rates. You're going to see people who are acting as omniscient technomancers who They've are kind of a, acting as a central hub. An for, AI surround, they know they know where everything going. They know where the good guys are. They know where the bad guys are. I, I, I think to, to a certain extent, I think the future of warfare is going to look a lot more like, like chess than dodgeball. Uh, you, if, if, you, if you understand what's happening and you know exactly what you're up against, where it is, when it is, you can kind of know when you can win and also know when you need to retreat. You don't necessarily get to the point where you, you know, win or lose the battle of midway. You know well ahead of winning or losing what the likely outcome is. And that drives probably better decisions. I think you're going to see a lot less casualties, a lot less fatalities. You're not going to allow yourself to, you know, wheel your way into a scenario where everyone gets wiped out. Right. And there and there's good and bad there. I mean, when you give people better visibility into what's going to happen, you imagine this. Imagine a world where we get into a fight that we can't really afford to lose. And then we find out that to stay in that fight, we're going to have to send 50,000 sailors to the bottom of the sea. I don't think the United States has the political will to do that. Uh, we, we just don't, especially knowing that it will happen. And so like, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But I, I think in general, I'm, I'm on the side of, having the information to make that decision. And that, I mean, it's going to make decisions a lot harder for these guys because right now there's a lot of, I guess I'll end with this. In current warfare, fog of war allows for enough indeterminism that someone can make hard decisions without really knowing what the impact would be. You, you, you believe, hey, this might work. Everyone might be fine. It is interesting to ponder what happens when that, uncertainty is removed. Mm. What happens when, when you order someone to do something, 
you're no longer sending them into a you know into a, a non-determinate you know liminal space it's like oh well they, they might live they might not what happens when you know that they are with a high degree of certainty going to die mm. um that will be a, a change in the nature of warfare at at a, at a very high level now of course the flip side is like i said i think there will be lower casualty rates better decisions will be made but it's going to make for a very hard set of ethical quandaries but i don't think anyone i i, I the flip side is i don't think anyone would argue that it's better to not know I don't think you'd find anybody saying it's better to not have that information in your decision-making process. So this Navy SEAL has, uh, is omniscient. They've got enhanced uh, imagery, enhanced knowledge. Probably a hundred to one ratio of autonomous systems to men. You know, every, every person who's going to be out there is going to be working in a highly networked fashion so with they're, hundred they're, they're commanding systems. drones and robots and, and and basically they're well some of them are extensions some will be commanding and i think a lot of them are going to be just autonomously doing their jobs you know suppose that you have that navy seal he might be aided continuously by 10 drones that are sensing the world around him looking for things that are a threat he's not so much commanding them as consuming the information that comes in and he's not watching 10 drone feeds He's just seeing in his augmented view of the world where those threats are. And as things become a critical threat, the system is able to highlight that to him. He doesn't have to look at 10 drone feeds and say, huh, that guy's running. I, I think he might be going over there. The system's going to say, hey, this is the top threat. It's the only thing that might kill you in the next minute. You need to deal with this. What do you want me to do? So it, it's going to be a little different than com he won't be commanding the drones so much as, you know, them feeding feeding him a view of the world and i i, I it, it's a i i act like this is the future but of course this is what we're doing with our customers right now i mean like the, the pe people are doing these things in exercises and in small level conflicts all over the world right now it's just going to be a different thing when it's so have, you, have you taken a time to dream five years out beyond i mean so you're building with five the technology years out, i know exactly what i'm doing five, five years is easy like the, th the things that are going to be relevant five years out we we're we're starting to build them today like you know, you know, we just we just uh, we just started construction on a nine hundred million dollar factory in Columbus, Ohio, to build our autonomous fighter jets. Those are going to be in combat before twenty thirty. So twenty thirty, easy, easy for me. I, I know exactly what but we're. The question be is, what are you starting to design and build in twenty thirty? Yeah, that's that that that's that's the interesting one. I it's mean, it's actually hardly anything. Uh, in in general, Andrel is very focused on building weapons for that kind of immediate near term it, it's it, it it's it's leaked out through the press that we have certain teams working under a mandate called china 27 which is if you're if the, if the feature you're building yes. or the the capability you're working on is not going to be ready for a fight with china before the end of 2027 you can't be working on it you need to you need to find something that is relevant to that and huh. Um, that's, I, I don't want to say that I'm not even thinking about 2030 and beyond. It's just, I, I, I'd probably say I dedicate 1% of my time. Like, I'll tell you what, one thing I think, I think you're going to see subterranean warfare become a much bigger part of the future. Really? Oh, hunt, it's, I, I believe it's the next major war fighting domain. I've said this many times and everyone thinks what that is that? Not. What is that? Drilling machines? What does that look like? Yeah, more or less. I mean, uh, have you seen the movie, The Core? Oh it's my about God. the guy. How, it was a while ago. 2006, I think. Yeah. It's about a group of guys who have to drill to the center of the Earth to use nuclear bombs to restart the Earth's core, spinning to protect us from uh, from 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 from, uh, from cosmic rays. Um, it's not a scientifically sound movie, but uh, something like that. You know, the, the United States and the Cold War. Uh, sorry, the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War both had subterranean programs, building vehicles that moved through the crust of the Earth just like a submarine would move through the ocean. And the Soviets actually built a prototype and then lost it in the crust <laughs> of the earth. Um, so like, it, it worked that well. It worked wow. that it just went off and they, and they lost track of it, melting through the crust. Um, I, I think that that's going to become a very powerful part of the future of warfare. And I'm not talking about you know just tunnels or bunkers. I mean, using the crust of the earth as a fully three-dimensional battle space mm. that you will be moving supplies through, uh, you'll you'll be doing electronic warfare, kinetic warfare, psychological warfare, uh, you know, high end logistics, and uh, that, that that I don't think is relevant to China. The technology is just not quite there. I, I can't really build things at scale sure. that are relevant by then. That that's one of maybe the few things I think past the twenty thirty timeline 
I think it's going to become a huge deal. And they're, they're, at some point, the same way you see a Space Force, I think it's very likely you'll see some kind of subterranean core. I, I don't know exactly how wow. what that's going to look like, but right, you know, right now the people who work on Sub T, it's like you know a, a group in the army whose job is to deal with bunkers and tunnels. I, I think it'll become a, a large enough part of warfare that you're going to need a dedicated group that focuses on the unique challenges of the subterranean domain.